Welcome to another City Planner Masters where I take you through a University Masters module about urban planning or while building in city skylines. This week our focus is on how design influences movement and the urban environment's impact on shaping human interaction and public social life and crime. We'll delve into how design can either help or hinder the evolution of a vibrant and safe public realm. As the renowned urban designer Young Girl explains, first we shape the cities then they shape us. In certain European countries such as Scotland, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Estonia, Latvia, Austria, Czech Republic and Switzerland, the freedom to roam is extended to all citizens. Unlike in North America where ownership laws dictate who has access to certain spaces and goods, European property rights can be more fluid and less defined. Although legal boundaries exist, they are often difficult to discern. For example, while a private path may be shared by a strata corporation, some paths over private property are public rights of way. In addition, local governments sometimes leave public park spaces to be managed and maintained by the developer or strata corporation. Understanding the complex web of property rights that define public and private spaces is essential to effective urban design, which can either emphasize the hierarchy of rights that go with these spaces or blend them together while subtly demarcating private areas. City Skylines 2 definitely likes to limit citizens right away. You cannot even connect paths to the back of property lines at the moment of parks or schools, whereas in City Skylines 1 you could. However, let's add some more right away options for our citizens with more paths and sitting options. David Sim emphasizes the importance of enclosure in urban living, particularly through the use of courtyard blocks. Not only do these structures provide privacy and security, but they also create a microclimate that can protect from or capture wind or sun and deliver low rise density. Additionally, courtyard blocks offer a range of private, semi-private and shared spaces that promote connection and foster tolerant communities. On the other hand, shopping streets and centres exist on different points along this continuum. While main streets are public rights away at all times, shopping centres are semi-private spaces during the day and private spaces after hours. Outdoor shopping and restaurant areas occupy an ambivalent position as they may appear to be public spaces but are often owned and managed by private companies. It is important to note that the public nature of streets may be modified when they are part of business improved districts or BIDs. BIDs are widely used in the USA, Canada and Britain and serve as a means for business owners to organize events and control the quality of services such as additional garbage collections and rapid responses to graffiti. While there are a few examples in Australia, such as the Adelaide Business Collective, they are more commonly used in New Zealand. For example, in Auckland, safety and crime prevention is managed through a partnership between the City of Auckland and the BID. The city also supplies bids with live pedestrian activity. As you can see, the wharf area has above usage for this time of day. But why is understanding your pedestrian traffic important? Because both higher than average and lower than average pedestrian areas require crime prevention strategies that are different from one another. Higher areas require surveillance around scammers and pickpocketers, traffic incidents, and lower traffic areas require monitoring, especially at night for incidents of assault, theft and vandalism. Let's move over to city skylines and put into place some of Auckland's strategies into my Euro themed city Framdale. Auckland has implemented the usual police patrols and private security who patrol the streets from 7am to 11pm as well as alcohol bans and CCTV cameras but also community and rapport building initiatives such as coffee with a cop, transport bollards to prevent major vehicular incidents and business fog cannon subsidies. What is a fog cannon and how does it help prevent crime? Fog cannons can fill a shop with dense fog in seconds, stopping criminals from seeing what's going on and preventing further damage or theft. These need to be rolled out across states in America with high business looting and organized shoplifting groups. Theft from stores by individuals or by organized gangs is not only a major problem for business owners but also urban planners in the design phase. You cannot just build a city and rely on the police to sort out the criminals. It is up to the urban planners and architects to include spatial measures within master plans and policies. 
According to the Global Economy, who cite the UN, in 2016, Denmark was the global leader in theft, excluding robbery, with 3,949 per 100,000 peoples, followed by Sweden, Uruguay, Australia and Grenada. The bottom of the graph with low theft rates is Senegal, Kenya and Nepal, but when looking at robbery, which may accompany assault, only Uruguay maintains a position in both lists. So that was Denmark in 2016 to 2017, and as you can see, the trend was heading down until recently. And this is partly attributed to the global squeeze on wages, cost of living, and a rental crisis. And as you might have guessed, a large proportion of theft within Denmark is stolen bicycles. But all is not what it seems. Marcus Olivia states that crime rates per capita are commonly employed to compare and rank cities worldwide. However, this widely accepted practice is based on the assumption that crime increases proportionately with the number of people living in a region. And because Denmark's population has recently risen sharply, larger crime numbers were inevitable. For example, in Denmark, the theft rate in the municipality of Aalborg is almost the same as in Sørød. However, less crime occurs in Aalborg than expected for cities of a similar size, while crime in Sørød is above the model expectation. This disagreement arises because of the different population sizes. Since Aalborg is more than 10 times larger than Sørød, we expect rates in Aalborg to be larger than in Sørød. When we account for this tendency and evaluate their Z-scores, we find that the Z-score of Aalborg is negative 2.47, whereas in Sørød, the score is 2.43. Such inconsistencies have an impact on the crime rankings of cities. The municipality of Aalhust in Denmark as well, for example, is ranked among the top 12 cities with the highest theft rate in the country. However, when we account for the population to crime relationship using Z scores, we find that Aalhust is only at the end of the top 54 rankings. Rankings and data is important for an urban planner, especially at the policy level. A firm understanding that per capita data is often variably skewed by population growth must be understood when looking at cities' crime data. But what can we do with that in city skylines? When you look at your district's data and see large amounts of red indicating crime take into account your population but open up another safe city and compare it to a district with a similar size population your city might not actually have a crime epidemic so what is Denmark doing about all this Denmark has attacked the issue of theft through social and policy measures, targeting schools with programs and alternative pathways rather than criminal proceedings, as it is evident that once a young person is within the criminal justice system, it is hard for them to escape. Toronto has followed also by not charging first-time shop offenders with an offence, but simply giving them a warning. So I wonder if in city skylines, if we refuse to build a prison, whether the AI will introduce social policy measures instead. I doubt it. But let's head into city skylines and introduce some safety measures for our cyclists, including bike racks in public spaces and outside busy shops with lighting and surveillance cameras. So despite over 20,000 reported cases of bike theft in Denmark in 2016, cyclists have become better at safeguarding their bikes. Many now secure their bikes to fix objects and the Danish VIN system allows people to check whether a bike has been reported stolen. Bike thefts are often opportunistic or organised, but the police prioritise more urgent crimes naturally. The Danish bicycle VIN code system requires a unique code embedded in the bike frame for compensation and insurance claims, and cyclists can check the National Police app to see if a bike has been reported stolen. However, new technology is being explored to replace this system. As Denmark is one of the few countries that require you to register your bicycle like you would a car, perhaps bike sharing alternatives are the answer, as criminals are less likely to steal a branded bicycle as they are difficult to move or sell. Before we move on to who has the right of way into the city, it is important to investigate the urban planner's role on crime against homeless people, because as you might see here in these pictures, several cities have chosen a path of denying homeless people access to public space, and some cities have implemented great urban policies and spaces that include homeless people in the process. Ultimately, the main goal of policymakers is to get people into homes, but this ideology requires some realism. 
cities will always have a level of homelessness and people sleeping rough. But are there any cities with an almost net zero rate? In an article by Haley Edwards, she says many cities deliberately implement defensive architecture and that creates a hostile environment. It is estimated that Manila in the Philippines has a homeless population of 3 million people, while New York City has 68,000 people. Edwards states that France and Finland and Greece are at the forefront of using urban planning tools to help alleviate homelessness, but how are they doing this? According to an article by Fransom and Dorling, a leading cause of homelessness is the end of the private sector tenancy, namely the lack of affordable and adequate housing solutions. Let's head into Thornton and find a better ratio of zoning social amongst private properties. Clumping social housing together only promotes crime and isolation. Rather zone individual lots than whole streets with the same brush. We will go with the one social housing dwelling for every four private rental model, which is based upon the updated finish model for affordable housing. As you can see, I'm ignoring the zoning demand bar in City Skylines 2, as this is not indicative of real world market simulations. Rather, it is there to demonstrate a quasi economy that balances the game's mechanics. But I will start this neighborhood with a one to four ratio of social to private dwellings. Finland has a mandate to make all new buildings and redevelopments 25% social housing. According to Statistics Finland, there are 1.3 million apartments in Finland, and 34% of those have been constructed using state subsidies. Finland also has a stable level of housing construction of 7,000 to 9,000 new apartments built every year. And why is housing so important and integral in Finnish urban planning? Because the right to housing is enshrined in the Finnish constitution. Finland now aims to push the 25% model to 35% over the next decade. Decade, but this is a country with high taxes, so let's raise the taxes in my city of Thornton, but lower the taxes for the most vulnerable sims and see what happens. Public access and the right of way. Permeable buildings serve as a conduit to connect public footpaths, railway stations, retail centres, barber shops, and private homes on the upper floors. They make the area more walkable by providing shelter from rain or sun on unpleasant days. Who has the right to the city? Compared to the 1930s and 1960s, the relationship between urban form and public safety is now better comprehended. In the 1930s, Radburn, New Jersey, a garden suburb, plan was introduced by Stein and Wright, which emphasised the separation of pedestrians from cars and homes surrounded by shared green space. However, despite its affluent and green setting, crime soon became a huge problem. Criminals found the unfenced rear lot lines attractive, and the lack of casual passive surveillance by cars had the opposite effect of what was intended. This problem worsened when the plan was applied to poorer housing estates where residents built walls to keep out criminals and walking trails were abandoned. Stein and Wright had, without realising it, uncovered the design principles that a new generation of planners in the 1960s could use. They developed crime prevention through environmental design, or CPTED, which emphasised maximizing passive surveillance supplemented with active surveillance through CCTV and sensors. Instead of shrubbery, trees were added, human scale lighting was installed, and mixed activities replaced the 8 to 6 desolation landscape of commercial only CBDs. CPTED has had its critics, but many of its principles are not just about excluding those who are supposed criminals, they fit with broader arguments for the good city. If you'd like to learn about how cul-de-sacs are crime prevention busters and all things cul-de-sacs, click the link above here. So unfortunately we won't talk about them in this video, but moving into crime prevention now through more urban design. Holmes Glen Neighbourhood Activation Plan In an effort to revitalise a neglected area along Warrigal Road, Monash City Council in Australia led an urban design project. The site connects Home Glen's train station the TAFE, which is like a community college, and a local shopping strip. Council consulted with Victoria Police, local traders, and the broader Ashwood Chadstone community to identify public safety issues in the area. The project identified several issues impacting public safety in the area, including regular graffiti and vandalism, poor lighting, and several blind spots and obstructions to lines of sight. These factors deterred the community from using the space, which ultimately led to a decrease in natural surveillance. 
surveillance. To address these issues, the Council implemented the Holmes Glen Neighbourhood Activation Project. The project received a 250000 Public Safety Infrastructure Fund grant and a further 280000 from the local council. Crime prevention through environmental design measures were applied to improve the identified public safety concerns, enhance the space's amenity and encourage community use. The project included the installation of a bouldering wall, a shared pedestrian and bike path, a bike maintenance station, a community-inspired mural, lighting, vegetation and communal seating. The project's upgrade of the shared pathway and surrounding area transformed the underutilized space into a community meeting hub. The space now encourages interaction, improves line of sight, increases natural surveillance and provides safer connections for people moving through the area. The Holmes Glen Neighbourhood Activation Project has achieved its objectives in revitalising the area. The eastern side of the Warrigal Road, Holmes Glen Shopping Strip and Rail Trail is experiencing increased pedestrian activity because of this. This has reduced crime rates associated with the cycle walking route to the local shopping centre. The site is more frequently used by pedestrians and cyclists, increasing access to transport and shops, thus benefiting local trade. It has also become a popular meeting spot for community members, enhancing social cohesion in the area. How does the design of the public realm contribute to the sociability and quality of a place? Let's find out. Young Girls Life Between Buildings Book 2010 introduces three types of activities that require specific environmental needs to be met. The first is necessary activities. These activities such as going to work or school, shopping or waiting for transportation occur regardless of the weather and typically involve some form of walking. The quality of physical environment has a minimal impact on these activities. They just have to be done. The next is optional activities. These activities such as going for a walk or a stroll, eating lunch outdoors or taking a child to the playground are influenced by weather and environmental factors including crime. People tend to avoid congestion or unsafe safe areas when engaging in optional activities. And the third is social activities. These activities like socialising with friends, watching passers-by or children playing together are typically a result of necessary or optional activities and occur across the public-private space continuum. The quality of the environment is crucial to support necessary and optional activities that encourage social activities. The diagram here shows you that the connection between outdoor space quality and the frequent of different activities is very important. In Yarn's book, it's crucial to recognize how different outdoor activities are impacted by the quality of the outdoor environment, specifically how improved quality lends itself to the development of recreational and social functions. Conversely, a reduction in quality has been shown to decrease the prevalence of these very activities. It's important to note that the character and content of outdoor life, not the number of events, is the focus of what we are talking about. The activities that make public spaces especially attractive and safe and meaningful are also the most sensitive to the quality of the physical environment. Making deliberate decisions at the city and site planning levels is crucial to establish the foundation for the development of a well-functioning outdoor space. However, it is only through careful consideration at the planning level that the true potential of these areas can be realized. Neglecting this process can lead to wasted potential and unused spaces. There is a variety of factors that an urban planner must consider even though these may sound dumb and rather benign. But as we enter this section, think about a local unused green patch in your area, or the one on screen, because it's important to focus on how a human feels spatially in this public environment when designing or redesigning a space for this area. These things include general and specific demands related to basic activities like walking, standing, sitting, seeing, hearing, and talking. These basic activities serve as a starting point for urban planners since they are in integral to nearly all other activities. If spaces are designed to make walking, standing, sitting, seeing, hearing and talking attractive, the foundation for a broad spectrum of other activities like play, sports and community events will be established naturally. Look at these two pictures and think to yourself, which one invites you to walk through, stand around, sit, look at, listen and talk to others? Each picture provides you with a different set of demands and a different level of invitation. Which one would you feel more comfortable in?
Now here are two pictures from City Skylines 1. Remember to focus on those basic demands. Which one invites safety for you? Now here are two City Skylines 2 pictures for you to assess your safety and comfortability. Now I'm going to put up the four pictures of all of them again. Put yourself in an elderly person's shoes or that of a child and think about their walking, standing, sitting, seeing, hearing and talking. In other words, have you ever been in a space and just had an off feeling despite the fact that nothing happened to you? This feeling is the result of the designers not even applying the most basic demands of walking, standing, sitting, seeing, hearing and talking into the design phase because if you can't feel safe and comfortable walking, standing, talking, hearing in that space, you are sure not going to do any other activity there. Let's drill down on the first basic demand and I can guarantee you, you will never look at a space again without analysing the demand placed upon that space again. Walking is primarily a form of transportation, but it also offers an informal and straightforward opportunity to be present in the public environment. People walk to run errands, see their surroundings, or simply for the pleasure of walking. All forms of foot traffic rely on specific demands on the physical environment that are determined psychologically and physically. One of the most essential demands for walking is space. It is necessary to have enough room to walk reasonably freely without being disturbed, pushed or required to maneuver excessively. The challenge is to define the human level of tolerance for interferences encountered while walking so that spaces are sufficiently narrow and rich in experiences yet still wide enough to allow room to move around. Tolerances and demands for space vary significantly from person to person within groups of people and from situation to situation. For example, observations of the traditional evening stroll in the square at Ionina, a city in northern Greece, illustrates how the number of participants change as the evening progresses. Parents with children and elderly people walk up and down the square at the beginning of the stroll, but gradually the children and the elderly disappear as more people come out. Later on, the middle-aged adults and others withdraw from the bustle, and by mid-evening, only the young people of the city continue to walk back and forth in the throng. In situations where crowding can be managed, the maximum acceptable density in two-way pedestrian traffic streets and sidewalks seems to be around 10 to 15 pedestrians per minute per metre, or three and a third feet, of street width. If this is exceeded, the pedestrian flow is divided into two opposing parallel streams. This means that pedestrians need to keep right to move through the street, which restricts freedom of movement. When the pedestrian stream is limited, streets can be narrow, such as small streets in old cities that are often no wider than one metre. However, accommodating wheeled traffic, such as baby carriages and wheelchairs, requires more space. For example, Sturoget, the main street in Copenhagen, was converted from a mixed street with motor traffic to a pedestrian-only area with wider sidewalks, resulting in a 400% increase in the number of baby carriages. Pedestrian traffic is highly influenced by pavement and surface conditions. Uneven ground surfaces, cobblestones, sand and loose gravel can be unsuitable, particularly for those with walking disabilities. Such conditions can have a negative impact on the experience of pedestrian travel. People tend to avoid wet and slippery pavements, snow, water and slush, especially if they have walking problems. Walking is physically demanding, and most people have limited capacity for walking. Studies have found that the acceptable walking distance for most people in daily situations is around 400 to 500 metres or 1300 to 1600 feet. However, for children, elderly individuals and people with disabilities, this distance is often considerably less. The determination of an acceptable distance is not just limited to the physical distance, but also the perceived distance which is influenced by the quality of the route. A stretch of 500 metres may seem very long and tiring if it is straight, unprotected and dull path. On the other hand, the same distance can be perceived as short if the route is winding and provides stimulation en route. Walking can be exhausting, leading pedestrians to make difficult decisions about which routes to take. Generally speaking, direct routes and shortcuts are preferred, with only significant obstacles such as hazardous traffic or extensive barriers leading to deviations. 
The desire to take the shortest route is so strong that it often overrides other concerns, as evidenced by observations of pedestrian behaviour in various settings. For example, in a survey of a Copenhagen square, pedestrians were found to cross the street diagonally, even though this required navigating a sunken area in the middle of the square using two short sets of stairs. Similarly, at the Campo in Siena, pedestrians were observed following a sloping pavement for 400 feet, despite the need to walk 10 feet down and then up again. When it comes to busy streets, pedestrians tend to choose the shortest route over the safest one, Except in cases where automobile traffic is particularly heavy, the streets are wide or pedestrian crosswalks are well placed. The combination of heavy automobile traffic, barriers and difficult street crossings has resulted in numerous detours and unreasonable restrictions on pedestrian traffic. This issue is particularly evident in Kongens Nivtorv, a large square located in the centre of Copenhagen. Pedestrians are forced to stay on the periphery of the square and navigate around various large and small islands within the area. In the 1970s, the pedestrian landscape of the square consisted of 48 islands that pedestrians could walk between, in stark contrast to old photographs where pedestrians moved across the square naturally and leisurely in all directions. Efficient pedestrian systems should prioritise organising movement along the shortest distance between natural destinations within an area. Once the traffic layout is resolved, it's essential to focus on designing individual links in the network to create a highly attractive walking system. Let's head into Thornton and work on our street layout following Gell's method. When designing pedestrian routes between buildings, it is essential to consider the number of potential users. The street section should be proportionate to the expected foot traffic to create an intimate space that prevents people from aimlessly wandering in a large, empty area, and aimlessness can also invite criminal activity. To create a deeper appreciation for larger spaces, it is best to approach them through smaller spaces, by including sequences and contrast between small and large spaces. The experience of moving through a large area is greatly enhanced then. However, it is important to note that, to maintain a human scale throughout planning, small spaces must be genuinely small, otherwise large spaces can quickly become too overwhelming. When crossing a large open space, it's typically more comfortable to stay along the edge rather than traversing a broad surface or walking down the middle. By walking along the edge, one can experience both the large space and the small details of the surroundings such as the street facades or spatial boundaries. On one side, you'll see the open field or square, and on the other, the edge of a forest or a building facade. Walking along the edge of a space gives two distinct experiences instead of one, and in the dark or bad weather, moving along a protected facade is often an added advantage. This design principle is executed particularly well in many southern European city squares, where pedestrian traffic is guided through low arcades along the periphery of the square. These arcades provide a cosy and intimate space that protects pedestrians from wind and weather while still offering a fantastic view of the large open space from between the columns. Conversely, paths placed in green belts in residential areas are often located in the middle of the space, leaving only small strips of landscape on each side. Differences in levels pose a significant challenge for pedestrians, much like detours for cars. Any large movement upwards or downwards requires more effort, additionally muscular activity, and disrupts the walking rhythm. As a result, people tend to avoid changing lanes and detours instead like when driving. For example, for the same, pedestrians often choose to walk a short detour or take greater risk over walking up or down in situations where differences in level are greater or more difficult. Research by Ola Florgemark of the Technical University in Lund, Sweden, analysed the pedestrian traffic moving from a bus stop on one side of a heavily trafficked street to a shopping centre on the opposite side. Of the three possible choices, 83% of the pedestrians chose to take a 50 metre detour by a pedestrian crosswalk, 10% walked directly across the street, and only 7% chose the pedestrian tunnel with two sets of steps. Which one would you take? 
When it comes to directing pedestrian traffic, ramps are generally the preferred option over stairs. They offer greater accessibility for people with strollers or wheelchairs. The primary goal is to avoid any changes of level wherever possible. If however people need to be directed up or down, ramps should be utilised. Additionally, the design of public spaces plays a crucial role in creating a welcoming environment for people to stay. Without details such as benches, trees and interesting facades, it can be difficult to find a place to stop. Cities that are conducive to staying have unique facades and a variety of supports in their outdoor spaces. Now let's turn to seating. Public spaces that are well equipped should provide a variety of seating options to accommodate all user groups and encourage them to stay. Primary seating such as benches and chairs should be provided for both the more demanding categories of users and situations where the need for seating is limited. The optimal placement and comfort level of primary seating is preferred when there is sufficient space. It is essential to provide an adequate amount of primary seating that is strategically placed in locations that offer users as many benefits as possible. Whereas there's supplementary seating, which is in the form of stairways, pedestals, steps, low walls, boxes, and other structures, and these should be provided when the demand for seating is particularly high. Steps are especially possible since they offer good lookout points as well. The spatial design of a public space should include a relatively limited number of primary seating options and a larger amount of secondary seating options, providing optimal seating arrangements for modest to high user traffic. Conversely, many empty benches and chairs, such as those found during off-season periods at cafes and sidewalks and resort hotels can give the impression that the space has been abandoned, which is why it is crucial to consider the number and placement of seats thoughtfully. Recreational seating opportunities are important for public spaces, but there is also a need for benches placed throughout the city for resting. In Copenhagen, many elderly residents have expressed the need for more places to sit. A good city or residential environment should have suitable seating every 330 feet to ensure comfort and convenience for all. The pleasantness of a place is affected by the sensory of security it provides. This includes protection from criminal activity and vehicular traffic. Jane Jacobs, in her treatment of planning problems in large US cities, has noted that many areas with high levels of activity and liveliness have lower rates of crime. This is due to the mutual protection provided by the presence of many people. The natural street watching that occurs in these areas can have a significant impact on safety. For example, in Venice, where there is always someone watching, the incidence of canal drownings is practically zero. One of the most important safety requirements for outdoor activities is the prevention of vehicular traffic. Failure to meet this demand will inevitably limit the scope and nature of these activities. It poses a challenge for both children and the elderly who would have to be accompanied by adults when crossing the street or even walking down the sidewalk. A significant factor that plays a crucial role in any situation is not the actual statistical risk, but the feeling of risk and uncertainty. Therefore, planners must work on both actual traffic safety and the sense of security in relation to traffic. In Australia, for example, research shows that 86% of children under 6 years old walking on ordinary vehicular streets held hands with an adult, while 75% of them were allowed to run freely on pedestrian streets. Although traffic-free environments like pedestrian streets are the best solution for safety and security, the Dutch Woolnerf principles which promotes slow, vehicular traffic in predominantly pedestrian and bicycle areas, represent a significant improvement compared to typical street situations. A survey conducted in Copenhagen from January to July demonstrates the link between climate and activity patterns. As winter transitioned to summer, the number of pedestrians doubled and the number of people standing tripled as more frequent and longer stops became commonplace. Additionally, the character of activities related to standing changed, as stops to eat, drink and sightsee increased. Street performances, exhibitions and other events made a large contribution to the total activity pattern during the warmest months. Sitting activities were non-existent during the coldest periods, increased dramatically when temperatures around the individual benches reached above 10 degrees. 
In January, approximately 30% of people's activities were standing, while 70% was moving. However, in July, 55% of activities were standing and sitting activities. Pedestrian streets have transformed subtly into streets primarily used for standing and sitting. A study on comfort and climate conditions carried out in San Francisco by Peter Boselman reveals a similar trend to that of Scandinavia. People require direct sunshine and protection from the wind to be comfortable when they are outdoors. On cool days, parks and plazas that are in shadow or windswept are scarcely used, while those that offer sunlight and wind protection are heavily used. By addressing climactic factors during city and site planning, many issues can be avoided. In Scandinavia, the wind and its accompanying cooling have always been a significant challenge necessitating climate-conscious city and site planning. Traditional buildings in Denmark's old towns are low. Attached buildings situated along narrow streets with small courtyards found behind the buildings. These low settlements allow most of the wind to be conducted over them while capturing and retaining sunshine. As a result, the local climate in these towns is considerably better than in the surrounding open countryside, and the number of hours one can comfortably spend outdoors is much greater. Proper design has effectively moved these towns hundreds of kilometres south in terms of climate. Unfortunately, new building projects such as spread out single family housing areas and multi story residential buildings tend to have poorer local climates. The outdoor areas in front of many multi-storey buildings are much worse off than the surrounding open land, especially high-rise buildings that catch strong winds at 20, 30 and 40 metres above ground and direct them downwards to chill everything and everybody. Buildings should be positioned to define the shape and function of outdoor space. In these two examples on screen now, how do the building footprints define and relate to the open space? This is all to do with building lines and set Backs. Building lines are crucial for creating a cohesive frontage and defining the public realm. They also ensure that new developments are seamlessly integrated into existing streets. To maximise a building's interaction with the public realm, minimise setback distances. However, if buildings are allowed to step back, it's important to ensure that the resulting spaces are both functional and attractive. This table on screen outlines general guidelines for building line setback distances with various locations. Keep in mind that garages or parking areas in front of the building can undermine the relationship between the building and the street. In suburban areas, garages should be located to the side of principal buildings recessed behind the main building line. Public spaces such as streets, parks and waterways without proper surveillance can feel unsafe, especially at night. Unfortunately, park fences can exacerbate this issue by creating an unwelcoming visual impact. These spaces should be appreciated and enjoyed by all, but neighbouring buildings can often neglect them. A building that faces onto public open spaces can foster a sense of ownership and care, as well as establish a unique identity. Furthermore, buildings that face parks or waterways are typically more valuable, which can offset the cost of creating single loaded streets. By orientating buildings towards the public realm and running access ways or footpaths along the boundaries, it creates a welcoming front door and promotes the use of the public space. Transform your public spaces with lively and engaging frontages. Here's how. First, incorporate frequent doors and windows whilst minimizing blank walls. Second, use narrow frontage buildings to create a vertical rhythm on the street. Third, articulate facades by adding projections like bays and porches to create a welcoming atmosphere. And finally, consider lively internal uses that can be seen from the outside or spill onto the street. This table on screen provides a grading scale to evaluate designs based on the amount of active frontage, with grade A frontage being the ultimate goal. While mainly found in core retail areas, even housing frontages can be brought to life with attention to detail. Grade A includes more than 15 premises for every 100 metres, more than 25 doors and windows every 100 metres, a large range of functions, no blind facades and few passive ones, much depth and relief in the building surface and high quality materials and refined. Whole buildings play a crucial role in identifying locations of civic, commercial or visual importance in urban areas. They serve as focal points for various activities such as town centres and transport junctions. 
However, the benefits of tall buildings must be weighed against the potential negative impacts on the microclimate, environmental performance of nearby buildings and active frontage. Medium rise buildings are often the best choice in urban situations as they can accommodate a range of uses, have the potential for medium to high densities and generally have lower energy demands and construction costs. In suburban areas where two or three storeys are common, it is recommended to place taller buildings in key locations such as on corners, at the end of vistas or around parks. Decisions regarding building height must also consider street building height ratios to ensure good enclosure. Building depth has a critical impact on the need for artificial lighting and ventilation. This affects the variety of uses that can be accommodated. The table on screen provides a guide for assessing the impact of building depth on natural ventilation and lighting, and hence robustness. Corner sites are highly visible, featuring two frontages that can provide additional entrances to the building. This unique layout creates an ideal opportunity to blend different uses and services. However, houses on corners present a challenge since they must face in two directions simultaneously. Standard building designs employed by many developers are ill-suited to meet this requirement. Rather, design customs or novel building types must be considered. To accentuate the corner, prominent windows or entrances can be added to the apex and the height can be emphasised by utilising a mansion block of apartments or integrating a specialised function to the mix. Here are five different pictures of how you can do corner setbacks. The first one here is corners are heightened to emphasise the node, as you can see. The next is setbacks and increased building heights create a sense of formality. The third one here is rotating the building line to create a square on the diagonal, as you would in Barcelona. The fourth one here is the corners are projected forward to make like four statues. The fifth one is the asymmetrical building line emphasizes a particular direction. The width of a building has a significant impact on its overall flexibility, as well as its capacity for personalization. It also affects the amount of active frontage and vertical rhythms that are visible in the elevation. If designed properly, buildings comprised of 5 to 7 meters wide, or daylit cells or modules, can provide an exceptionally versatile form. Each cell can be easily combined as needed and is similar in size to a small shop or terraced house. However, it is more challenging to add rear extensions without obstructing light and ventilation in widths below 5.5 metres, something to consider. Streets, squares and parks are outdoor spaces that can be compared to rooms, say in a house, each with its own unique characteristics that define the nature of the space. They can either lead to, run through, or surround other areas. What types of outdoor rooms are these two spaces, and what type of connections do they offer? When considering streets, how do they differ depending on whether they go to, through, or around spaces? These descriptive terms reflect various assumptions about speed, users, layout, and the physical characteristics that signify their purpose. So it pays to focus on the spatial design of your city, not just for crime prevention, but also safety. And finally, let's check in on Thornton and look at the crime index. Here is it before we made any changes to the city. And here is it after. Next up in Module 5, we'll explore the topic of why is it difficult to implement standardised design and city planning practices and how all city planning and urban design is subjective. So give me a follow if you want to find out when Module 5 is coming out. Thanks for watching.